Tamarie Farnell. Good morning to all. Um, um, this morning we're going to look at how far can force go. Now we've been locked up in our homes for quite a number of weeks now. It seems like a very long time, a couple of months coming up to a couple of months being um, stuck in our homes and uh, laws that uh, or people that tell us uh, those that are in government telling us that we're not allowed to go to the beach or we can't do any shopping, there's no restaurants open and there's all this speak about social distancing. Well, I want to s examine how far can force go? How far can force go? Let's go and turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians, as you can see behind me here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. So if you like to turn in your Bibles there, uh, verse 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, we were here during Easter time in this passage. We've been here uh, often, too, during the last few weeks in, in terms of the rapture of you and all those sort of things that are all culminating together. So how far can force go? We see that today people want to be out of their houses and begin to live normally again. I mean, that's the desire of us all, really, just to be able to see our families, to be able to give our grandchildren a cuddle, and, and to, to be at, at work and just as normal as, as what we uh, should be. Uh, demonstrations are happening in some of the United States states, and we have demonstrations, let us out. You know, beaches that are closed, and you can't go for a drive. So here in New Zealand, we have had single digit new cases. In fact, we've had no cases for two days in a row. So this week, we've had no new cases. The day before, two cases linked uh, to an aged care facility. So why are we kept at home? And how far can force to be enforced to be staying at home go? How far can this force go? As you can see in some of the photographs behind me, you will notice there that there are, if I just pull it, maybe if I pull it a little bit closer, um, then you might be able to see it a little bit better. You'll see protests that are happening. I want my job back, says one sign over here. I want my job back. Reopen. Reopen, NH, I'm not sure, is that New Hampshire and that uh, state in the United States. We've got people here protesting, not being able to go to the beach was torture. And so people are wanting to be out of their houses, living a life as normal. After all, how many cases were there in New Zealand? And most of them were overseas cases. There are only a few uh, cases or groups. Now, the 85% or 87% of these cases have now recovered. So we only have about 150 cases in all of New Zealand, and there's no new cases or maybe one or two linked to these groups. And, and yet the whole country has to suffer for that 151 cases, uh, all, which are being quarantined, if you like, being held in their homes until they're able to get out, until they have recovered. And 87% of the people have recovered. Sadly, 21 deaths in New Zealand. Uh, but people die of all different things. Now, I'm not minimizing that at all. Uh, but certainly, how far can force go? So in New Zealand, there's been no community transmission in, in a sense of in the whole town or the whole city. 
Um, and, and so we have the community maybe in, in aged care facilities. Uh, we have a transmission in, in one particular school. But there's no community transmission. You can't say that the whole of Christchurch is affected and the community is spread. Uh, no. Did we do the right thing by isolation? And that is a question that's being asked at the moment. Have we done the right thing by isolation? And of course, hindsight, maybe we should have just isolated those that were weak and frail, those that had uh, diseases that could harm them if they contracted the uh, Chinese virus. And we could have said to those sort of people, you know, just lock yourself away, just put yourself uh, out of harm's way, and then let everybody else go about their business. And, and of course, that, uh, that's all hindsight. That's all hindsight. Now, we don't have herd immunity at the moment, which was so much talked about when speaking of the measles, the uh, measles outbreak we had recently and other infectious viruses. Well, you might say, well, we've got injections for those. But these viruses, you know, the flu injection you get, you have to have every year. Why? Because the flu virus mutates, it changes. So even though we might have this uh, a jab for coronavirus or, or the uh, virus, the Chinese virus, next year it'll be different. And so it's not as though we haven't had the coronavirus before. It's been, it's been changing. Now, so it's, a lot has been talked about this herd immunity, this herd immunity. When I was a child, it was important for a child to get measles. And there were measles party for the specific effect of hum, uh, herd immunity. We wanted to be um, immune. We see people, the children, they run around on the floor and they get colds and they get flus. In their early days, they're developing their immunity to bugs and bacteria and viruses. Now we've been locked away in our homes. Now we've been isolated from that virus, which for some people is good, yes. But now we don't have this herd immunity. So if it were to come back again, wow, it's going to strike. We don't have that immunity. We're being forced into our homes, told that we cannot leave except for food, medication and exercise. Police checks are, are, are set up, checking on where you are going and where you've been. Especially, you know, we, we read about that in Sumner. On a nice sunny day, people want to go to the beach and they're off to the beach. And then they are being told you shouldn't be here. Well, they're distancing themselves from other people. They're distancing themselves from other people. So don't, does not the Lord trust us? All for your safety. Are they doing that for your safety? If you're, you're sitting on the beach doing nothing, distancing yourself from others, that may be elsewhere on the beach, are they doing it for your safety? What about herd immunity? If, if there's no herd immunity now, so there's no safety. They're not doing it for your safety. No one will have immunity except for those that contracted the Chinese virus. So those that have contracted the virus and have gotten over it, they have some sort of immunity. Now, the virus might change in latter years over time, and so that, that um, immunity will decrease. I don't know what it's going I'm not a doctor, but I'm just trying to use common logic and common sense here. In Romans 12, 18, if it be possible, as much lieth in you to live peaceably with all men. And Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. So obviously I'm not 
advocating here that we should demonstrate. We should go out with placards, we should um, go out with a mega horn and, and yell down the streets and, and all those sort of things. I'm still advocating for living peaceably with others. I'm still advocating obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. I'm still advocating that. However, let's be logical about this. Because at some point in time, things will change. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? Being locked away into our homes, we are now in, in a quite a bit being stopped from being about our father's business. We're not un we're unable to go letter boxing. We're unable to speak to our workmates in, in a sense, uh, apart from Zoom or or Google Meets or some other uh, hangouts that uh, are about today. We need to be about our father's business. So at some point in time, we're going to say, okay, enough is enough. Now, work might be closed. We might not be able to go to work. And so therefore, witnessing is becomes a little bit difficult. But we need to recognize, firstly, just tuck away in your mind, we need to be about our father's business, just as Christ was about his father's business. Fourth verse here that I want to bring to your attention is, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So at some point in time, we need to come to a, a, a prayerful decision and say, hey, we need to obey, obey God rather than men. Now, at the moment, we've been stopped basically witnessing. You know, anything that you put on YouTube which is against the, the establishment uh, is, is deleted. Anything that you might post uh, a Bible verse, for example, on Facebook, it might be uh, deleted or, or you might lose your job over it or whatever. The things that are happening, but we ought to obey God rather than men. And we need to be about our father's business. So that is our logical outlook for this. Okay. We want to be as peaceable and live as peaceable with all men. We want to obey them that have the rule over us and submit ourselves to them. But then on the other hand, we need to take a stand back because these are, as I've said, uh, the last message, they are but men, these rulers, these people who rule over us are but men, and they are sinners. They are still sinners. They still make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. So what is meant to be the compelling and propelling force in the lives of millions of believers? What is meant to be the compelling force and the propelling force in all believers, all believers. There have already been many forces at play in society. So the forces that play a part that it would force us, that would force us to live uh, a certain way. Forces that seek to force the Christians to comply with social norms. The acceptance of homosexuality, the acceptance of drugs, and they're trying to uh, legalize marijuana in New Zealand. We'll be voting on that. The acceptance of that in society. And we as Christians, are we to accept that homosexuality and drugs? Are we to accept that sex is being normal outside of marriage? Are we to accept vaccinations? 
and, and forget about the harm that they could do? Are we to accept any old hairdo? Are we to accept the way we dress with ripped jeans? Are we to accept the music of today's society? Are we to accept hoodies? And the list could go on. These are all accepted norms in society. And the Christian is asked to comply with those norms, comply with homosexuality, comply with drugs, comply with sex outside of marriage, comply with vaccinations, comply with hairdos, comply with the way we dress with ripped jeans and comply with the music of the world and comply with the, the hoodies and, and things like that, which are really are just a, a way of express, expression, a personal expression in terms of sin, isn't it? It's the acceptance that the society is trying to uh, cause us to accept the sin of the world. When our Lord walked on the earth, the world had similar forces at play. Tyranny by the Romans. Power struggle. There were sex and sexual sins that were rife. There was actually the Romans' downfall. There was strife, there was greed, there was war, there was religious norms that were promoted by the scribes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You know, these are the norms of society and so the scribes would, would promote those, the Pharisees would promote those, the Sadducees would promote those. Even though their doctrines were different, they still would promote them. Jesus went about doing good. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. So remember what we're trying to see, or try, trying to go towards. How far can force go? Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and hath, and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So Jesus went about doing good, even in this time of this struggle, the strife, the greed, the war, the religious norms that was promoted by the scribes, the Pharisees and Sadducees. He went about doing good. Now, we have the same in this society, right? I'll, I'll just flick back a couple of slides just to, to go back to this point. Okay? Society tries to force these norms upon us. The acceptance of homosexuality, drugs, sex, vac uh, vaccinations, hairdos, the way we dress, with ripped jeans, music, hoodies, all these sort of things. These are norms of society that are trying to force upon us. We need to be like Christ and go about doing good. Doing good. Those that follow Jesus thought that he would conquer the Romans and take back their country by force. That's what they thought. Now, the Christians, we, we're not going to take New Zealand back by force. The, the Christians in America are not going to take America back by force. Now, if it, if it happens, I don't see it in the Bible. What I see in the Bible is the next event, which is the rapture. We see also in the Bible that things are going to get worse and worse. So we see that these followers wanted to be conquered, or wanted to be liberated, I should say, liberated from the Roman rule. Then he was taken by force. Hello? Arrested. He was tried. And he was crucified. <coughs> and he was crucified. The disciples and the followers obviously were devastated were devastated. Here, they were uh, under the Roman rule, the norms of society, 
and, and hope. The hope was in Christ, the Messiah, to liberate us from all this. To rule and reign over them. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And then, taken by force, Roman soldiers, arrested, tried, crucified. Oh boy, they would have been devastated. Jesus was dead as loving hands laid him in the tomb. Hope gone. Force leads to destruction. The countryside gets destroyed. Homes get destroyed. Families get destroyed. All right? Food chain gets destroyed. Hunger. Financial markets crash. Compare in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem. Many people lost their lives. The temple destroyed. The walls destroyed. We have the Wailing Wall at the moment. The eastern gate is still there, but although it's closed at the moment, but it'll be open as Christ comes through. So force leads to destruction. How far then can force go? It can go a long way. Force can go a long way. We've just had the example of Christ. Your life can be made a misery. If you protest, force may be applied to make you compliant. So if you protest against these norms, expect misery. Force even, which can be applied to make you compliant. For example, the, the recent Hong Kong riots that we've seen. And I'm not sure whether you can see those photographs there of the Hong Kong riots. It was misery. Or the 1989 Jiananmen Square protests. Standing in front of a tank and getting run over. Misery. How far can force go? Well, it can go a long, long time way. On the day that Jesus was crucified, force did its worst. Force did its worst. Hate, violence, injustice, envy, it all that reigned at the moment. And it still reigns today. Still reigns today. For three days, the seal on the tomb remained unbroken and soldiers kept their guard. Force can go a long way. A long way. Even to death. Was evil greater than good? Was Satan greater than God? There is a battle between good and evil that takes place today. And as for eternity, well, eternity, I guess from the moment that Satan fell, a battle has taken place. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world. We are fighting against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness and high places. Hebrews 12, 4 says, Ye have not resisted unto blood. You haven't, haven't resisted with blood by fighting and killing, strived against sin. You have not done that. Revelation 12, 7, 8. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. See the strife, the force that takes place here. In Revelation 19, you can read that for yourselves, uh, verses 17 through to 19. There, there is a war, the, the battle of Armageddon. 
at the end of the tribulation period. Force can do its worst. In Revelation chapter 20, we read about the final war at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. There is still force and force can attempt to do its worst. But there's victory in Jesus. So we have force that can do its utmost, as much as, as, as it can, and as much as it can, it is death. That's as much as what it can do. But we have victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Flood. Between the cleansing flood. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, how far can force go? Well, it can go a long way. It can take your life. But we have victory in Jesus. Christ was in the tomb, but on the first day of the week, victory. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. Force may have its day, but there is a limit to its reign. There is a limit. Matthew 16, 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? My mother-in-law's favorite verse. Quoted it often. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. We see this victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Death is swallowed up in victory. So how far can force go? Well, it has its limits. But we have victory in Jesus. We read in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's just... Quickly go there, Hebrews chapter 11. This is the faith chapter, verse 32 to 38. You see, there, there is, not everyone is treated the same in terms of this force that we live under, this, the, the force of these norms. 32, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, see the force, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, turned to flight the uh, fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had tri trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain in the, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. 
force can go a long way. But it cannot go all the way. It can take our lives, but it can't go all the way. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fourth can cut down a martyr, but it cannot kill the message nor kill the soul. No matter if they have been cast to the lions or they've been burnt at the stake. Whatever happens in a believer's life, force can go a long way, but it cannot have the victory. It cannot kill the message nor kill the soul. Force can make people kneel, but it can't make them pray. You may be forced to kneel, but it can't make you pray to them. Force can make people recite a religious creed, but it cannot make them believe. And this is the issue with easy believism or quick prayerism. Say this prayer and you'll be saved. It can't make you believe. Just because you've said the prayer doesn't mean to say that you're saved. It has to be an inward and then an outward expression of an inward change. The prayer is a response to an inward change, not a, 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 a prayer to receive something. No, it's, that's the wrong way. When you say a, a sinner's prayer, as they say, it, that's not to receive salvation, but it's an outward expression of what God has done the moment in your life. The moment you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, it's not by prayer. It's not by baptism. It's not by being a church member. It's not by giving tithes and offerings, not by doing good works. None of that. It's all of grace. And a prayer is an outward expression of an inward change, not the other way around. So the wage of sin is death, but through Christ we have victory over that death. So force can take our lives, but we have victory in Jesus. Romans 6, 23, for the wage of sin is death. And I'll just put a verse in there, which is 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty six. The sting of death is sin. For the wage of sin is death. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Because the wages of sin is death, and there's all have sin that come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And there is the sting of death, the wage of sin is death. For all have sin that come short of the glory of God. But then the second part is, this is the victory. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's victory. That's victory. Victory in Jesus and Jesus alone. So even though we may be cooped up in, in our homes and we're feeling like we need to be liberated and set free, um, which at one point and in, in point in time, we may, uh, Christians may do that, stand up for their rights. Protest. But force can go so far, right to the point of death. But that's as far as it can go. Because we have victory in Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life. Not death. The wage of sin is death. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is is the law, but we have victory in Jesus. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And so even though we may die, there is victory in Jesus. 
We can say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? There is no victory. As Christ rose from the grave, so we also will rise from the grave. Not with the same body, not with the same physical body. We will receive a new body. We're looking at that as we look at the rapture. And so that's true victory. So the question that we asked, how far can force go? Well, it can go a long way. But it can't go all the way. May this time, as we look forward to level two, and that uh, possibly will be announced or has already been announced, I'm not sure when you'll be viewing this video. And then on to level one, we'll be able to go about our father's business. At this point in time, we have to be obedient to the laws as long as it does not contravene the laws of Christ. So how long are we going to be cooped up for? In other words, how long are we going to not be able to meet? Because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And even more so, as you see the day approaching, and the day is approaching, we need to meet more and more. We need to be about our Father's business, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. We're unable to do that. Planes are not flying. Boats are not sailing. Borders have been closed. How long are we going to sit and wait? We, we wait upon the Lord in prayer and await for open doors. Yes, one day, as we read in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation period, Christians will lose their lives. Force will do its worst, and that's to take their lives. They'll be beheaded for their faith, for their testimony of Jesus Christ. But that's not victory. Victory is only in Jesus. May that encourage us. May that help us to look forward, not to a time of, of fighting force with force, but go about doing good. In Jesus' name.